All right. Well, welcome to what is this week five now of uh, the seven part series here on the agreement of sale. Today is uh, page page nine of 14. We're going to finish it up. We kind of went through half of it the last time because of the uh, inspection contingencies that overran into that page. So 14 starts off with titles, surveys, and costs. Um, again, this is probably one section that we kind of just glance over with the buyer or seller and uh, don't really pay much attention to it until we actually come across an issue. And there could be issues because it involves title. So part A, within blank days, seven if not specified, from the execution date of this agreement, buyer will order from a reputable title company for delivery to seller a comprehensive title report on the property. Upon receipt, buyer will deliver a free copy of the title report to seller. So that's really important because that right there says the seller gets a copy of this um, report. And Seth is always after these title companies to get a copy. And some title companies are very um, easy with it because they know him and they'll send it right over. But there's times when we have these title companies that we don't know. And a lot of times the seller side never really ask for it. Um, and they'll give us a little hard time, but here it clearly states in the contract, we get a copy. Okay, That's at least on the seller side. Did you side. share the document? Well, I can't see it, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> you see it now? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So, part B. Buyer is encouraged to obtain an owner's title insurance policy to protect buyer, okay, even if they pay cash. An owner's title insurance policy is different from a lender's title insurance policy, which will not protect buyer from claims and attacks on the title. Owner's title insurance policies come in standard and enhanced versions. Buyer should consult with a title insurance agent about buyer's options. Buyer agrees to release and discharge any and all claims and losses against broker for buyer should buyer neglect to obtain an owner's title insurance policy. Now, obviously, if you get um, a mortgage, you have to get a title policy, but there are those cash deals that uh, you know, the seller says, well, I don't want to buy it. There you go. Um, and some attorneys won't hold settlement without the purchase of it. So, you know, you have to be aware of all of this. Now, Aaron, you're on here. Yep. Can you go over the difference between an owner's title insurance policy and the lender's title insurance policy? Sure. So the owner's policy protects the owner. The lender's loan policy protects the lender. What happens with a purchase is that the different, so you have to get lenders coverage for whatever the loan amount. Is. A lot of times the owners, the sales price is higher, so the owner pays the difference. So if you're talking about a $180,000 loan amount, then they would pay the additional for the owner's coverage. Um, if they do not want owner's coverage, then they are not protected from anything. The only person that is protected is the lender. Um, so now we're one of those companies that we're, you, you know, we're technically not allowed to, well, not technically, we're not allowed to close a, a closing without issuing title insurance. So sometimes we get into the predicament where cash buyers don't want title insurance. A lot of times they end up paying just as much as they would to an attorney for closing it and stuff. So we usually just try and go over the differences, um, and we also, as everybody's aware, we issue the enhanced policy. It's 10% more. And we started doing that. I forget when, but we're doing that because we don't want to, we want to give them the best 
option and the best coverage. And we don't want them to come back and be like, oh, well, I didn't know I could get that additional coverage. So, but that's the main difference. We had an issue just came up over the last couple of days where there was a mortgage. It was a second mortgage, the client of Diane Ramps, and they thought it was taken care of in bankruptcy. It was not. Um, they were resolved from paying the note back, but not the mortgage. So they refinanced two years ago and they were under the impression that that policy would then help them. Well, unfortunately it did not. It, it only helped the lender during a refinance. That's all you need covered is the lender's coverage. So. Okay. Again, any questions on this title insurance and, and policies, um, you can always consult with Erin. She'll get back to you as soon as possible in it. And uh, you know, it's, it's really important, so. All right, part C. Now we go into who pays for what here. Um, buyer will pay for the following. One, title search, title insurance and or mechanics lien insurance or any fee for cancellation. Two, flood insurance, fire insurance, hazard insurance, mine subsidence insurance or any fee for cancellation. Um, three, appraisal fees and charges paid in advance to mortgage lender. Four, buyer's customary settlement costs and accruals. So right there, if a buyer backs out of a deal and title insurance is already ordered, and Aaron, roughly how much is that? Just ordering it? Um, $100 for the search and tax, because those are done right away, so. Okay, well, here it's in the contract that the buyer has to pay it. So it's in the contract, okay? Tom, can I ask you a quick question yeah, before you go ahead. further? Okay, Please. so let's say that you have, you got your title insurance and um, does that title insurance cover like only the county that the house is in? Like what if someone places a lien from like a different state. Mm. Okay. Like a long lost uh, brother. Yes. Or like, you know, we're right on the line of Maryland and, and PA. Yeah. And so like, what if someone does something that is in a different state mm. and tries to attach it to the house that's in PA? Does Good the question. title insurance cover that? Erin? So whoever's filing the lien or judgment or claim would need to file it because that's where the property is located. Um, I don't know legally, but when property do a lien search as well as the lien search against the property. So anything comes up that's been filed in that. Um, if it's filed in a different county than what the property is in, then it's not going to come up. Okay. So it would, so if it's discovered after the sale that there was a lien, let's say versus Franklin County versus Cumberland County, then they're not protected by the title insurance. I mean, I guess it, I'd have to know like all the details. So that's something that you and I could talk about after, but there is like an actual, you know, there, there's a, a lien search done on the buyers and or sellers if it's filed in are you saying like it was filed in the county yes then if and it, it didn't, wasn't picked up because they did the search in franklin county and it was filed in another county yeah so whoever filed it should have filed it in the prop where they live okay they should have known that but yeah so when you do a search you don't the buyer search there's no there's no courthouse that holds everything. Right. So, yeah. So when you're doing a buyer search or a seller search, the only, you know, so the title insurance would not protect that, that person per se. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Part D. Any survey or surveys required by the title insurance company or the abstracting company for preparing an adequate legal description of the property or the correction thereof will be obtained and paid for by seller. Any survey or surveys desired by buyer or required by the mortgage lender will be obtained and paid for by buyer. Okay. 
So there you have the dividing line of who pays for the survey um, if there is a discrepancy. Okay. E, the property will be conveyed with good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at the regular rates, free and clear of all liens, encumbrances, and easements, accepting, however, the following, existing deed restrictions, historic preservation restrictions or ordinances, building restrictions, ordinances, easements of roads, easements of visible upon the ground, easements of record, and privileges or rights of public service companies, if any. Okay. Um, F, if a change in seller's financial status affects seller ability to convey title to the property on or before the settlement date or any extension thereof, seller shall promptly notify buyer in writing. A change in financial status includes, but is not limited to, seller filing bankruptcy filing of a foreclosure lawsuit against the property, entry of a monetary judgment against seller, um, notice of public tax sale affecting the property, and seller learning that the sale price of the property is no longer sufficient to satisfy all liens and encumbrances against the property, also known as a short. So there you have it. Um, I think that has come up a couple of times uh, in the past, not so much recently because everything's selling at a higher price to cover any shortfall. But, uh, you know, years ago, we've had some issues there where all of a sudden the, the seller owes a little more than it had thought. So just be careful of that. Definitely try to get uh, proof of a payoff or, or some kind of statement to show that the, your sellers owe a certain amount and if it's very close to the sales price minus fees, you probably should order a payoff right away just to make sure, okay? Uh, part G, if seller is unable to give good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at the re regular rates as specified in paragraph 14E, buyer may terminate this agreement by written notice to seller with all deposit monies returned to buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. Or the buyer can take such title as seller can convey. Okay. If the title condition precludes seller from conveying the title, meaning the seller can't sell the property, um, buyer's sole remedy shall be termination. And upon terminating, all monies will be returned to buyer according to the paragraph 26 of this agreement. And the seller will reimburse the buyer for any cost incurred by buyer for any inspections or certifications obtained according to the terms of this agreement. And for those items specified in paragraphs 14C, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and paragraph 14D. So if the if for some reason the seller can't give reputable title, um, clear title on this property, they're gonna to have to reimburse the buyer if the buyer terminates. Next section talks about uh, paragraph H, oil, gas, mineral, and other rights of this property may have been previously conveyed or leased and sellers make no representation about the status of those rights unless indicated elsewhere in this agreement, okay? Um, where would they indicate it? Well, the next box has a checkbox, oil, gas, and mineral rights addendum or par form OGM, and it should be attached to this agreement of sale, okay? We're rolling right along now. Any questions so far? Okay. Paragraph I, coal notice. This document may not sell, convey, transfer, include, or insure the title to the coal and rights of, and rights of support underneath the surface land described or referred to there herein 
and the owner or owners of such coal may have the complete legal right to remove all such coal and in that connection damage may result to the surface of the land and any house building or other structure on or in such land. Um, this notice is set forth in the manner provided in section one of the act of July 17, 1957. Buyer acknowledges that he may not be obtaining the right of protection against subs subsidence resulting from coal mining operations and that the property described herein may be protected from damage due to mine subsidence by a private contract with the owners of the economic interest in the coal. This acknowledgement is made for the purpose of complying with the provisions of section 14 of the Bitmus Mine Subsidence and the Land Confer Conservation Act of April 27, 1966. Buyer agrees to sign the deed from seller, which deed will contain the foresaid provision. Um, I don't know if we've ever ran into that as a company here, but uh, it sounds like that if there is coal underneath the property and it's owned by a coal mining business and they're digging and digging under there, um, the property is subject to possible damage. Um, and this is a warning to the buyer, okay? Paragraph J, the property is not a recreational cabin as defined in the Pennsylvania Con Construction Code Act unless otherwise stated here, okay? That's for your properties that are on, I'm not sure if it's on state ground or not, um, or, or, you know, or lease land um, where the construction code is a little different than what is for residential, okay? Has anybody ever dealt with that before here in our office or on this call? I dealt with one Kong that was on lease land. Okay, was that the one we talked about? Was that your father's? No, my father's actually was on its own land. Okay. Um, but I did do one on lease land um, up in Caledonia. Mm -hmm. And it was um, the longest part, honestly, for that is like the district forester has to approve it. Mm. And that was just like a very long process to get it to the state, get them to approve everything and then get it back. And they do have very, very strict rules that I don't think everyone is aware of. Okay. Interesting. Um, how did you find out about that? Or was it already known that the seller relayed to you? Or how did you find out about it? I knew it was on lease land because it was in the listing. Okay. And I knew that it had to go to the district forester because of the other agent on the other end. He okay. previously dealt with a cabin in that area, but then also whenever we did receive like the rules and regulations and stuff, it was in the rules and regulations that any like anybody that purchases it can only purchase it cash. They had to be a resident of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And again, they had to approve like who was going to live there. Mm. Okay. And the people had to agree to all the rules. And then basically they're waiving their rights of the land. And it says right in the, contract or like the agreement that if the district foresters wants any part of that land back they technically can take it okay so it's kind of risky i mean for the buyer because really they own the house and technically if the district forester wants they could take everything up right into your front door okay hmm. interesting um Paragraph. We do a lot. We do a lot of those leased lands in this area because of that uh, state park, that yeah. forest. They usually take anywhere from four to eight weeks for all of that approval. Hmm. Okay, so a thirty-day settlement is not usually very uh, doable. Then, no, definitely not. Okay, just keep that in mind when we're dealing with these leased. Uh, recreational cabins in Pennsylvania. Um, paragraph K, this was new to me when I did this and uh, I was gonna do a little more research on it, but uh, this is talking about 
private transfer fees. Um, this property is not subject to a private transfer fee obligation unless otherwise stated here, okay? And if it is, then there is a private transfer fee addendum to the agreement of sale, okay? It's for par form PTF. So number two, um, underneath K, paragraph K, is this is a notice. Notices regarding private transfer fees, okay? In Pennsylvania, private transfer fees are defined and regulated in the Private Transfer Fee Obligation Act, which defines a private transfer fee as a fee that is payable upon the transfer of an interest in real property or payable for the right to make or accept the transfer. If the obligation is pay, the if the obligation to pay the fee or charge runs with title to the property or otherwise binds subsequent owners of property, regardless of whether the fee or charge is a fixed amount or is determined as a percentage of the value of the property, the purchase price or other consideration given for the transfer. Private transfer fee must be properly recorded to be binding and sellers must disclose the existence of the fees to prospective buyers. Where a, transfer, where a private transfer fee is not properly recorded or disclosed, the act gives certain rights and protection to the to buyers. So I've never ran into this again, but apparently um, RPAC, um, you know, they every year our local board calls us individually and, and ask for a donation to, to help with RPAC um, make legislations or, or lobby against certain legislation. And I actually looked it up um, for Pennsylvania, this private transfer fee on YouTube. And I guess it was about 10 years ago, RPAC was trying to get rid of all of these in Pennsylvania. Um, Sue Helm was actually one of the people on the video requesting this and it sounds like it's a big thing out in the city areas mainly pittsburgh it sounds like that this is happening where there's a fee attached to any transfer uh who knows who gets the fee probably maybe the de original developer or, or somebody um at the beginning of the chain and every time this product is transferred you pay either x amount or a percentage of the sales price so uh, again, the seller should know this if they've paid it when they went to settlement and it was presented to them in such manner. Uh, but sellers may not know because, you know, you have a laundry list of fees, closing costs when you buy and you don't realize that, hey, this fee is going to occur every time when you sell this property. So just be careful of that. I, I don't know that we have that here. So I've never seen it. If anybody has, I'd love to hear it. But uh, it sounds like from the video, it's a big thing out in that Pittsburgh area. So, okay. All right, last section here for today. Uh, 15, notices, assessments, and municipal requirements. A, in the event any notices, sorry, in the event any notices of public and or private assessments as described in paragraph 10F, excluding assessed value, are received after seller has signed this agreement and before settlement, seller will within blank days five of receiving the notices and or assessments provide a copy of the notices and or assessments to buyer and will notify buyer in writing that seller will, okay? so. Perfect example of this, and I'm sorry I keep scrolling here. I don't know why my computer keeps doing it automatically. Um, but for just for an example, um, years ago we had a property that was under contract in the borough of Carlisle, right by the Sunnyside Diner where it used to sit. And we're under contract, you know, four weeks in, um, seven week settlement, and. The seller gets a notice that says, hey, we drove by your property, your sidewalk needs replaced, okay? So once we received that notice, we sent that over to the buyer agent to give to their buyer and just said, hey, 
we just got this notice and they want us to redo the sidewalks, at least a portion of it where the tree had shifted it, okay? So from there, after we gave notice, paragraph one, um, this, if the seller complies, if our seller says, all right, we'll fix it, fully complies with the notices and or assessments at seller's expense before settlement, if seller fully complies with the notices and or assessments, comma, buyer accepts the property and agrees to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement. Now, if the seller says, well, I'm not gonna be living there anymore, uh, the buyer can pay for it, okay? So number two, seller does not comply with the notices and or assessments. If seller chooses not to comply with the notices and or assessments or fails within the stated time to notify buyer whether seller will comply, comma, buyer will notify seller in writing within five days that buyer will, A, comply with the notice and or assessments at buyer's expense, accept the property and agree to the release in paragraph 20 of this agreement, or B, the buyer can terminate this agreement by written notice to seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer, okay? According to the terms in paragraph 26 of this agreement. Now, if the buyer fails to respond in that time period, the five days, or fails to terminate this agreement by written notice to seller within that time frame then the buyer will accept the property and agree to the release in paragraph 28 of this agreement, okay? Um, any questions on that portion, part A? Okay. Part B, if required by law within blank days, 30 is the pre-fill. Hey, yeah. I'm sorry, I did have a question. Yeah. So if, if they fail to respond, then sort of by default, then they would be responsible for repairing it once they take possession, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Then then they're they're willing they're they're going to have to accept it. Now, where it becomes tricky is if it has to be done before settlement. Okay. So all that has to be worked out. Um, B, if required by law within blank days, 30 is the default from the execution date of this agreement, but in no case later than 15 days prior to settlement date, seller will order at seller's expense a certification from the appropriate municipal departments disclosing notice of any uncorrected violations of zoning, housing, building, safety, or fire ordinances and or a certificate permitting occupancy of the property. If buyer receives a notice of any required repairs improvements, buyer will promptly deliver a copy of the notice to seller. One, within blank days, five is the pre-fill, of receiving notice from the municipality that, re that repairs improvements are required, seller will deliver a copy of the notice to buyer and notify buyer in writing that seller will A, make the required repairs and improvements to satisfy the municipality. If seller makes the required repairs improvements, buyer accepts the property and agrees to release in paragraph 28. B, sellers will not make the required repairs. If seller chooses not to make the required repairs and improvements from the, from the municipality, buyer will notify seller in writing within blank days, five again is the default, that buyer will accept it and accept a temporary access certificate or temporary use and occupancy certificate and agree to the release in paragraph 28 and make the repairs at buyer's expense after settlement, okay, or two, terminate this agreement by written notice to seller and get all their deposit money back. The buyer gets all the deposit money back. Now, if the, again, if the buyer fails to respond within the time stated in paragraph 15B1 lowercase b or fails to terminate this agreement by written notice to seller within that time frame of the five days, 
buyer will accept the property and agree to the release in paragraph 28 of this notice provided by the municipality. And then lastly, number two, if repairs improvements are required and seller fails to provide a copy of the notice to buyer as required in this paragraph, seller will perform all repairs improvements as required by the notice at seller's expense. And then the next statement, paragraph 15B2, the one I just read, will survive settlement. So if the seller doesn't disclose something and there's, a, let's say they, never said, hey, once you buy this house, you're going to have to redo the sidewalk. And the buyer takes possession of it, never had been disclosed to them. And the municipality sends a final notice of having to do this repair. And the buyer brings it up. And the seller says, oh, yeah, I, I forgot. Well, the seller is going to have to pay for this repair because this survives settlement, okay? So does anybody have any questions on this portion? It, it's actually very similar to the, uh, the language is kind of, and the process is very similar to the uh, maintenance requirements of the seller. You know, once the property goes under contract, the seller has to maintain the property. And if a hot water heater goes out then you know, the seller has, uh, they can either fix it um, tell the buyer they're not fixing it, and then the buyer can terminate. So it's very similar language to that. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Um, what if they would get a notice, and this is just a hypothetical, it's not anything I dealt with, but sure. what if they would get a notice that says something like, um, within a year, you're going to be expected to hook up to public sewer? Mm -hmm. And they figure, well, you know, they're settling in 60 days. It's not going to affect anything and it may or may not happen. And I mean, what do, you, what do they do? I mean, technically, I think they're still supposed to supply that. But if they think it's not even going to be a definite. Right. What do good they question. Need to do? It's a good question. I think we actually dealt with that um, here locally on Fishing Creek. Brooks, did you deal with that on Fishing Creek? Yeah, I mean, it was a, a still a few years out, but I think you still definitely have an obligation to disclose that to the buyer. Um, anytime yeah. you get a notice like that, you have to present it to, to the buyer. That way they're aware and can make the decision for themselves as to what they want to do. Yeah. And the lender will probably want to know that too, especially with VA. I think if um, public utilities is available within X amount of feet, um, they're going to want you to hook up. So probably the best answer to that, Sue, is probably if you know about it, disclose it. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to stop there and continue with 16 next week. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of this. So next couple pages, I think, are pretty important because it talks about return of deposits and um, how to handle issues that come up, who gets the deposit, stuff like that. So uh, it's very important to attend these classes. Um, it'll certainly help you write a better offer and a cleaner offer um, and know how to deal with any issues that come up. So I think there's a question maybe on a chat here. Okay. Um, if we don't have any more questions, then we'll end this here and uh, we will see you next week, okay? One more thing I have though, Brooks. Yes. For next week on our Tuesday call, did you already have a topic or is it all right for me to give you a topic? <laughs> um, I, I was thinking of a topic that I was gonna do. So I, I don't know if everyone's aware, but um, Zipforms has a new button called Disclosures and it's hooked up with Sheller, or Seller's Shield. And it's basically a piece of software that helps 
sellers fill out the property disclosure statement um, digitally. And it's actually, in my opinion, a very cool little program that um, it, it prompts them through the disclosure, makes them fill it out in its entirety and uh, make sure they're doing it properly and don't miss anything because you know in this day and age and always it's a huge liability as to how they fill out this disclosure especially when um you know a lot of times these deals aren't having home inspections so for your protection and the seller's protection it's it's definitely a good idea to look at this software um and check it out and maybe put it to use in in your business so that was what I was thinking for next week, but we can certainly push that back if you have something else. No, I mean, between that and what Kong's doing with this uh, contract, we also are having, I had two situations this past week where agents um, are still not completing the buyer broker form properly and understanding you know, that you need to fill in all the sections of the buyer broker form in case the buyer goes out and buys a for sale by owner on you and stuff. So I just wanted to, whether or not Kong wants to include that after we get through the contract or we wanna bring that up on a Tuesday meeting. But um, I was having a conversation with an agent yesterday about that. And there was something else she brought up but I can't remember what, what it was. And I don't see her on the list of people on this call today. So, it, you know, it, it ties all into that buyer broker form, but, uh, you know, it's just um, something I think we need to go back over once again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we can either so do that. I, I don't on know whether Kong, or... you want to do it, Kong, on, at the end of this. Yeah, we can do it real quick. Um, really, the, the, the main parts of the buyer agency form is all the fill in the blanks. Yeah. Um, I'm not talking about today. I'm just saying, do you yeah. want to add it to this portion of your Thursday call or do we want to do it on a Tuesday call? No, we, we can do it on, on a Tuesday call. Um, okay. Let's see where Brooks goes with the, the zip forms, how much time we have left, and uh, maybe we can squeeze in 10, 15 minutes ago or buyer agency. Real yep. quick. Sounds good, guys. All right. Thank you very much, both of you. And uh, Good job, Kong, as usual, and uh, we'll look forward to next week. Awesome. Again, right. any questions, give us a call. Tim, yep. Brooks, or myself. Yep, bye-bye.